For the longest of times, the cradle of humankind has provided scientists with some of the most in-depth understanding of ancient hominins to date. However, in 2013, a discovery by two cave explorers uncovered the fossils of a new hominin that in all senses of the word should not exist. Mixing traits of ancient humans with traits of Homo sapiens, the species named Homo naledi felt more like a mix and match than an actual part of the Homo species. But who exactly was Homo naledi? Why was it so strange? And how is it possible that an ancient species like this was dated to a time when Homo sapiens walked the earth? The discovery of Homo naledi is perhaps one of the most interesting archaeological finds of the 21st century. Although it shook the science community to its core, the discovery of these hominin species was anything but easy. It all began on September 13, 2013, when cavers Rick Hunter and Stephen Tucker were exploring the rising star cave system in the Cradle of Humankind, South Africa. For those who don't know, the Cradle of Humankind, located about 50 kilometers northwest of Johannesburg in South Africa, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site renowned for its rich fossil records. Offering a mountain of insights into early human evolution, the cradle spans approximately 47,000 hectares. But what makes it so special? Well, it boils down to geology. See, this region's karst landscape with its limestone caves is what makes all the difference, as it has the amazing ability to preserve fossils exceptionally well over millions of years. So far, the region has yielded significant discoveries, such as the fossils of Australopithecus africanus, Paranthropus robustus, and the focus of this video, Homo naledi. Homo naledi was discovered in the rising star cave system, a treacherous network of underground passages and chambers located in the Malmani Dolomites. The Malmani Dolomites, located in South Africa, are rock formations composed of dolomite. These ancient rocks are composed of magnesium-rich limestone, Millions of years old, these rocks formed a landscape abundant with caves and underground passages. The discovery of the brand new hominin was far from planned and was actually an accident. While exploring the iconic Denaledi chamber, cave explorers Rick Hunter and Stephen Tucker unexpectedly stumbled upon a brand new chapter in our evolutionary story. After taking photographs of the fossils, they shared them with South African paleoanthropologists Pedro Boshoff and Lee Rogers Berger on October 1, 2013. Recognizing the potential importance of the find, Berger quickly got to work and assembled a team of experts, including Hunter and Tucker, who were named the underground astronauts. This team of small and agile excavators was able to navigate the narrow and challenging passages of the cave system to recover the fossils. However, this was no easy feat, as the site lies about 80 meters or 262 feet from the main entrance and requires descending a nerve-wracking 12-meter or 39-feet vertical drop. Because after the drop, the underground astronauts still had to navigate a 10-meter or 33-feet passage that narrows to as little as 25 to 50 centimeters or 10 to 20 inches at some points. And as insane as he was as foreseeing the sheer physical demand of the Rising Star expedition, Berger decided he needed to assemble a very specific team. But how he did it was as unconventional as they come. See, Berger simply made a Facebook post looking for scientists with experience in paleoanthological excavations and caving, who were also slender enough to navigate the cave's extremely tight spaces. Within 10 days of his post, he received nearly 60 applications and selected six scientists who would become known as the underground astronauts. These scientists were Hannah Morris, Marina Elliott, Becca Pechotto, Elia Gertoff, Kay Lindsay, then Eves Hunter, and Ellen Feurigel. Made up of only women, due to their stature, the team was led by expedition leader Berger, who led them into the depths of the cave system and the depths of history. In two main excavation periods, November 2013 and March 2014, over 1,550 specimens were recovered from the Dinaledi chamber. These specimens could be traced to at least 15 individuals of varying ages, from infants to elderly adults. A wellspring of information and every archaeologist's dream, this collection became the largest single-species hominin fossil assemblage found in Africa. But that wasn't the end of the story, as in 2013, our cave explorers Rick Hunter and Stephen Tucker 
discovered another 133 Homo naledi specimens in the nearby Lacedi chamber, representing at least three more individuals. After the excavation, the initial findings were published in 2015, and the species was named Homo naledi, with the specific name Naled, meaning star in the Sutu language, a nod to the complex and challenging cave system in which the fossils were found. After all this effort, the question stands, what fossils were found? And why were they in such a complex cave system? Thanks to the sheer volume of fossils found, the fossils of Homo naledi offer one of the most complete and captivating glimpses into the anatomy and possible behaviors of any ancient human relative ever. Almost like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle where each piece is a part of the skeleton, the researchers found 737 pieces, including parts of the skull, jaw, ribs, teeth, limbs, and even inner ear bones. To make things even more exciting, some of these bones were almost complete, like entire hands, feet, and even skulls with jaws still attached. Now this was extremely rare, as the fossils date back between 236,000 and 335,000 years old. The age on its own was a shocker, and we'll come to that. But besides the age, it was extremely rare to find fossils that old in as good condition as the Homo naledis. The main specimen, known as DH1, was the centerpiece of this puzzle. It includes parts of a male skull, the upper jaw, and a nearly complete lower jaw. But that wasn't all, as additional specimens, namely DH2 to DH5, also consist of parts of skulls. Now, one of the most intriguing aspects of the Homo naledi fossils is, as you'd expect, where they were found. I mean, the Dinaledi chamber is deep within the rising star cave system. It's about 80 meters, or about 262 feet, from any known entrance, and always in total darkness. This unusual location, for lack of a better statement, made no sense. So unsurprisingly, it sparked a lot of debate about how the bones got there. The researchers who first studied the fossils proposed that Homo naledi might have deliberately placed their dead in the cave which would suggest they had complex social behaviors. However, not everyone agrees with this idea, as some experts, like Prof. Chris Stringer, think it's unlikely that a species with such a small brain could have performed such sophisticated behaviors. They suggest other possibilities, like the idea that individuals might have sought shelter deep in the cave and become trapped there. Comparing Homo naledi to other hominin fossil records, like those of Australopithecus or Neanderthals, is quite an eye-opener. As we know by now, the Australopithecus species also had small brains and were adapted to both tree climbing and walking, while the Neanderthals had larger brains and were more advanced in terms of tool use and social behaviors. Homo naledi, however, seems to sit somewhere in between, with a mix of primitive and modern traits that add an additional layer of complexity to the story of human evolution. So, what did the species look like? And what kind of bodies did they have? Focusing on appearance and anatomy, the Homo naledi offers a striking snapshot of an ancient species that combines both primitive and modern traits in unexpected ways. For one, the adult males stood around 150 centimeters or 5 feet tall and weighed about 45 kilograms or approximately 99 pounds, with females being slightly shorter and lighter. This difference wasn't much and was a sign that the species displayed limited sexual dimorphism, with both sexes having a similar overall body size and shape. When it comes to moving around, Homo naledi, much like Australopithecus, walked upright and exhibited bipedal locomotion. However, their upper bodies retained some primitive features reminiscent of earlier hominins. For example, their ribcage was broad and similar to that of Australopithecus afarensis, suggesting adaptations for climbing. As expected, they had a small brain size, about 560 cubic centimeters for males and 465 cubic centimeters for females. But what made their brain stand out was not the size, but the structure of their brain, which was notably advanced. In fact, the impressions of their brain show a shape and structure somewhat like those of modern humans, including an asymmetrical brain with a more human-like frontal lobe. Weird brains aside, the skull of Homo naledi also presented a unique mix of characteristics. First up, its overall shape, while distinct, still shares similarities with early Homo species, like Homo erectus and Homo habilis. The cranium features sagittal keeling, 
a thickening of the bone that is rare in modern humans, but seen in some early Homo species. The skull also had a flat midface, minimal post-orbital construction, which means narrowing behind the eye sockets, and a well-developed brow ridge, although the arch is relatively weak. Unlike Homo erectus, Homo naledi lacked a long, low cranial vault, and the back of the skull was sharply curved, like that of modern human skulls. In the mouth department, the jaws and teeth of Homo naledi were basically a reflection of a diet adapted for high-quality food, with some features aligning with the genus Homo. Their teeth were smaller than those of early Homo species, like Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, but similar in size to later Homo species, including even modern humans. They had small molar crowns with five cusps, a trait found in modern humans, and in sizes that are comparable in size to those of Australopithecus, except their canine molars and premolars were notably smaller. The limbs of Homo naledi were also a blend of traits. For example, their shoulders were positioned similarly to those of Australopithecus, suggesting it aided in climbing and hanging. However, their hands combined features not seen in other hominins, with relatively long curved fingers suited for climbing, and more modern features in the wrist, palms and thumbs that may have facilitated tool use and object manipulation. Their lower limbs had a unique mix of primitive and derived features, including a long, slender femur with muscle attachments, indicative of efficient bipedal walking, and a unique depression in the femoral neck. As you can imagine, Homo naledi was quite a weird species, and an even harder one to categorize. Stay tuned to find out why. Up until today, the classification of Homo naledi within the human lineage has been a subject of ongoing research and debate. See, when the species was first described in 2015 by Berger and colleagues, it was placed within the genus Homo, due to a number of derived traits that it shared with other members of this genus. However, the combination of both primitive and modern characteristics makes its precise classification extremely challenging. One issue is that Homo naledi's anatomy suggests that it may lie close to the origin of the genus Homo. On paper, that seems like all the solution needed, but this is particularly intriguing given the young age of the fossils, which have been dated to between 335,000 and 236,000 years ago. For a better understanding of why this is a problem, consider the fact that this places Homo naledi in a time period when other more advanced hominins, including Homo sapiens, were already present on the African continent. This coexistence of Homo naledi with large-brained hominids was unexpected, unprecedented, and raised important questions about the diversity and adaptability of the early human species. But that's not all as the discovery of Homo naledi also contributed to the growing evidence that human evolution was not a simple, linear process. Instead, it appears that multiple hominin species evolved in parallel and coexisted for extended periods. Essentially, the existence of Homo naledi challenges the traditional view of human evolution as a straightforward progression from primitive to modern forms. For now, much is still unknown, but as researchers continue to study these remarkable fossils, they will undoubtedly uncover more insights into the life and times of this confusing human ancestor. Its classification might be a subject of confusion, but there is no argument about the environment it evolved in, or the insane adaptations it formed. Homo naledi evolved in a complex environment that was both challenging and dynamic. They evolved in the diverse landscapes of South Africa during the Pleistocene Epoch, the exact timing of Homo naledi's existence is still a matter of scientific debate, but they are generally thought to have lived between 335,000 and 236,000 years ago, overlapping with early modern humans. Their environment was shaped by a combination of climate fluctuations, diverse ecosystems, and the geological backdrop of the region, all of which played a significant role in shaping the evolutionary path of the species. A big player was the climate, during the time of Homo naledi, the climate in South Africa was extremely variable, with periods of both dry and wetter conditions. These fluctuations influenced the availability of resources, such as food and water, making adaptability a key survival trait for any species. The region where Homo naledi lived was likely a mosaic of different habitats, including open grasslands, woodlands, and even riverine forests. Such variety in ecosystems would have supported a variety of flora and fauna, offering both opportunities and challenges for Homo naledi. 
For one, the presence of grasslands suggests that large herbivores such as antelope and zebras roamed the area, providing potential food sources for predators and scavengers alike. The woodlands and riverine forests, however, would have offered shelter and resources such as fruits, nuts, and possibly small game. Regardless of the region, these environments require Homo naledi to be versatile in their diet and foraging strategies. The geological setting of the cradle of humankind where Homo naledi lived was dominated by the Malmani Dolomites, a rock formation that dates back over 2.5 billion years. This ancient landscape is riddled with caves and underground chambers, many of which were formed by the dissolution of dolomite over millions of years. The rising star cave system where Homo naledi was discovered is one such complex network of caves and tunnels. The Dinaledi chamber where the fossils were found is particularly deep and difficult to access, suggesting that Homo naledi had to navigate challenging terrains both above and below ground. The caves themselves may have provided refuge from predators and harsh weather, serving as temporary shelters or even as burial sites, as some researchers have speculated. The limestone and dolomite in the region would have also influenced the availability of water, with underground streams and springs potentially serving as vital water sources for the hominins and other animals in the area. Now focusing on the other animals during this period, evidence suggests Homo naledi shared their environment with a variety of other species, both hominin and non-hominin. During the Pleistocene, South Africa was home to a rich array of megafauna, including large carnivores like lions, leopards, and hyenas, as well as herbivores such as elephants, rhinoceroses, and various species of antelope. These animals would have been both competitors and threats, influencing the behavior and survival strategies of Homo naledi. The presence of other hominins, such as early modern humans or archaic humans, would have also made a difference. This is because their presence could have led to interactions either competitive or cooperative between different hominin groups. The need to coexist or compete with these species may have driven certain adaptations in Homo naledi, such as their ability to navigate complex cave systems or their unique combination of primitive and modern anatomical features. Speaking of adaptations, the unique anatomical features of Homo naledi might be a result of their adaptation to their challenging environment. Their small stature and lightweight frame would have been advantageous in navigating the narrow, confined spaces of the cave systems. While the combination of primitive features such as a broad ribcage and curved fingers suggests they retained some climbing abilities, which would have been useful in a landscape that included both open terrain and forested areas. The location of the fossils deep within the Dinaledi chamber has led some researchers to speculate that Homo naledi may have engaged in deliberate disposal of their dead, a behavior previously thought to be unique to more cognitively advanced hominins. If true, this would indicate a level of social organization and ritual behavior that is surprising for a species with such a small brain. Given the rapidly changing environment in which they evolved, the next question is, what exactly was their diet like in such conditions? Like most ancient species, the diet and feeding behavior of Homo naledi provide a fascinating glimpse into how this ancient species adapted to its environment and what resources were available to them. By analyzing their teeth, jaws, and the context in which their remains were found, researchers have been able to piece together an understanding of what Homo naledi likely ate and how they obtained their food. One of the most telling aspects of Homo naledi's diet comes from the structure of their teeth and jaws. Their teeth are smaller compared to earlier hominin species like Homo habilis or Homo erectus, and they exhibit features that suggest they were adapted to a high-quality diet. This means they likely consumed foods that were energy-rich and relatively easy to chew, similar to the diets of later hominins, including modern humans like you. The molars of Homo naledi were small, with low crowns and five cusps, much like those of modern humans, which are adapted for grinding and processing a variety of foods. But that's not all, as the wear patterns on their teeth suggest that while they could have eaten tough, fibrous plants, their diet probably included softer foods as well. Their canines and incisors were also smaller than those of earlier hominins, which might indicate a reduction in the need for tearing or processing large, tough pieces of meat or plant material. Interestingly, the third molar in Homo naledi is larger than the first and second molars, 
a trait that is more common in earlier hominids like Australopithecans. This suggests that while Homo naledi had some modern features, they retained certain primitive traits that may have been beneficial in their specific environment. As stated before, the environment Homo naledi lived in was diverse and could be unpredictable, with fluctuating climate conditions affecting the availability of food. This would have required Homo naledi to be opportunistic in their eating habits, likely consuming whatever was available in their surroundings. The combination of their small, wear-resistant teeth and the retention of some primitive dental features suggests that Homo naledi had a diet that included both plant and animal matter. They likely consumed a variety of plant foods, including fruits, nuts, tubers, and leaves, all of which would have been available in the woodland and grassland areas of the cradle of humanity. The small size and wear-resistant nature of their teeth suggest they might have actually processed some of their food before eating it, either by pounding or cutting, to make it easier to consume. In addition to plant foods, Homo naledi likely also ate meat, though probably not as a primary food source. Their small canines and lack of specialized teeth for heavy-duty chewing of tough meat suggest they may have scavenged or hunted small animals, but they were not primarily carnivorous. Instead, they likely relied on a diet that was varied and adapted to what was seasonally available. But how did they get their food? The structure of Homo naledi's jaws and teeth, along with their hand and wrist anatomy, suggests that they were well adapted to manipulating objects, possibly using tools to assist with food processing. Their hands were more modern in some respects, with a long thumb and robust first metacarpal, which would have made it easier for them to grasp and manipulate objects, such as stones for cracking nuts or tools for cutting meat. This ability to use tools, combined with their dietary flexibility, would have allowed Homo naledi to exploit a wide range of food resources. Essentially, this helped them survive in an environment where food availability could change rapidly due to shifts in climate or other environmental factors. Compared to other hominins, Homo naledi's diet appears to have been somewhat intermediate between that of earlier species like Australopithecans and later ones like Homo erectus, or even early modern humans. Australopithecans had larger, more robust teeth and jaws, suited to a diet that likely included more tough, fibrous plant material. Homo erectus, on the other hand, had a more modern dentition, indicating a diet that may have included more meat and less fibrous plant material. Homo naledi seems to have retained some of the primitive features of Australopithecans, while also developing more modern traits. This allowed them to occupy a niche that required both dietary flexibility and the ability to process a variety of foods. This adaptability would have been crucial in the diverse and changing environments of South Africa during the Pleistocene. While direct evidence of their daily lives is sparse, the archaeological context, their anatomy, and comparisons with other hominins help us piece together a picture of their possible behavior, culture, and even rudimentary technologies. There is no direct evidence of Homo naledi using tools, but their hand anatomy suggests that they were capable of precision grip and manipulation, similar to modern humans. Their long thumb, robust first metacarpal, and modern wrist anatomy indicate that they had the physical capability to make and use simple tools. Given their environment, it's plausible that they used tools made from organic materials like wood or bone, which would not have survived in the archaeological record. The stone tools they used may have been rudimentary and less refined than those of other contemporary hominins, like Homo erectus, who created more advanced tools, like hand axes. However, the lack of stone tools associated with Homo naledi could also mean that they relied more on natural objects or simpler methods for tasks like processing food or making shelters. Besides this, the discovery of numerous individuals in the Dinaledi chamber suggests that Homo naledi may have lived in small social groups. The presence of individuals of various ages, from infants to elderly adults, indicates a community that includes multiple generations. This kind of social structure is typical of many primates and early hominins, where groups are centered around family units or small bands. One of the most striking aspects of Homo naledi's lifestyle is the possibility of deliberate disposal of their dead, or layman's burial, in the Dinaledi chamber. The remote and difficult to access location of the chamber deep within the Rising Star cave system has led some researchers to propose that Homo naledi may have intentionally placed their dead in this chamber. 
If true, this behavior would suggest a level of social and cultural development previously not associated with a hominin species of such small brain size. The idea of deliberate disposal hints at a form of ritual or cultural practice, potentially the earliest evidence of such behavior in the human lineage. However, this interpretation is still debated, with some experts suggesting alternative explanations, such as the bodies being washed into the cave, or individuals getting trapped. If Homo naledi did indeed practice some form of burial or body disposal, it raises fascinating questions about their cognitive abilities and potential beliefs. While there is no direct evidence of religious practices or rituals, the intentional placement of bodies could indicate a rudimentary awareness of death, and possibly a belief system that considered the treatment of the dead as significant. In modern humans, burials are often associated with concepts of the afterlife or a form of respect for the deceased. While it's unlikely that Homo naledi had complex religious beliefs, their behavior might suggest an early form of symbolic thinking or an understanding of death that goes beyond mere survival instincts. So with the death out of the way, what was the daily survival like for them? Given their anatomy and environment, Homo naledi likely had a lifestyle that involved a mix of climbing and walking, similar to earlier hominids like Australopithecans. Their hands and shoulders suggest they could climb trees, perhaps to forage for food or seek refuge, while their legs and feet were well suited for bipedal walking, allowing them to cover long distances on the ground. Their diet, as discussed earlier, was probably varied, consisting of fruits, nuts, tubers, and possibly small animals. They would have needed to be resourceful and opportunistic, making the most of the resources available in their environment. Shockingly, despite their small brain size, Homo naledi's brain structure shows some modern features, particularly in the frontal lobe, which is associated with complex thinking, problem solving, and social behavior in modern humans. This suggests that Homo naledi may have had cognitive abilities that were more advanced than their brain size alone would suggest. The asymmetry in their brain, another feature shared with modern humans, could indicate lateralization of brain function, which is linked to advanced cognitive abilities like language and tool use. While there is no evidence to suggest that Homo naledi had language, these brain features might hint at a level of communication and social interaction more complex than previously thought for such an early hominin. Seeing how advanced such a primitive species was, the question now is, how did they relate to other hominids? The relationship between Homo naledi and other hominins is a fascinating and complex aspect of human evolution. Despite their unique combination of primitive and modern traits, Homo naledi existed alongside, or perhaps slightly before, other hominin species that were much more advanced in terms of brain size and technology. It's no secret that Homo naledi is a relatively recent addition to the human family tree, and their exact placement within the genus Homo is still a subject of debate. Homo naledi lived during a time when multiple hominin species coexisted in Africa. One of the most significant of these contemporaries is Homo erectus, a species with a much larger brain, more advanced tool-making abilities, and a wide geographic range. Homo erectus is often credited with being one of the first hominins to leave Africa and spread across Asia and Europe. So, as you can imagine, the coexistence of Homo naledi and Homo erectus raised intriguing questions about how these two species may have interacted. But that wasn't all, as in addition to Homo erectus, Homo naledi may have shared the landscape with other species, like Homo habilis, and even early Homo sapiens. Each of these species had quite different adaptations and survival strategies, and it's possible that Homo naledi occupied a specific ecological niche that allowed them to survive alongside these other hominins. For example, Homo naledi's smaller body size and mixed climbing and walking abilities might have enabled them to exploit different resources or environments, reducing direct competition with larger-brained hominins. The interactions between Homo naledi and other hominins could have ranged from competition to cooperation, although there is no direct evidence of contact between them. If they did encounter other hominins, these interactions could have been influenced by competition for resources, such as food and shelter, or by territorial disputes. On the other hand, it's also possible that Homo naledi and other hominins had minimal interaction, 
due to differences in the ecological niches or geographic ranges. But that aside, one of the key questions is whether Homo naledi interbred with other hominins, like how Neanderthals interbred with Homo sapiens. While no genetic evidence has been recovered from Homo naledi fossils yet, interbreeding between different hominin species is well documented in other cases. For example, Homo sapiens interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans, leaving genetic traces in contemporary human populations. If Homo naledi did interbreed with other hominins, it could have contributed to the genetic diversity of later human populations. There is also the question of other hominids' influence on the species. Given their primitive technology, it's unlikely that Homo naledi significantly influenced the technological advancements of other hominins. However, if they did have contact with more advanced hominins, there could have been some form of cultural or technological exchange. For example, Homo naledi might have learned to use more sophisticated tools or adopted certain survival strategies from their more advanced cousins. Conversely, more advanced hominins might have observed and adapted some of Homo naledi's climbing abilities or environmental adaptations. Essentially, the relationship with other hominids could have gone either way, ranging from learning new skills to death. But speaking of death, why are there no more Homo naledi around today? The extinction of Homo naledi, much like most of its life, is a subject of considerable interest and speculation among paleoanthropologists. Although there is no direct evidence pinpointing the exact cause of their disappearance, several factors likely contributed to their eventual extinction. One of the most significant factors that could have contributed to the extinction of Homo naledi is environmental change. The period during which Homo naledi lived was marked by fluctuating climates in Africa, including shifts between wetter and drier conditions. These changes would have impacted the availability of resources such as water, food, and shelter. And as the environment changed, the habitats that Homo naledi relied on might have become less hospitable, leading to increased stress on their populations. In particular, the transition from wooded areas to more open savannas could have posed a challenge. This is because, while Homo naledi's anatomy suggests that they were adapted to both climbing and walking, their small body size and unique skeletal features might have limited their ability to compete with other hominins better suited to life in open environments. That takes us to our second key factor in Homo naledi's extinction, which is competition with other hominin species. As stated before, during the time Homo naledi existed, Africa was home to multiple hominin species including the more advanced Homo erectus and possibly early Homo sapiens. These species had larger brains, more sophisticated tools, and potentially more complex social structures. As such, competition for resources such as food and shelter would have been intense, especially as environmental conditions fluctuated. Homo erectus, for example, was more versatile and better equipped to adapt to changing environments. With their more advanced technology, they could have easily outcompeted Homo naledi for key resources, leading to the latter's decline. With that said, Homo naledi's relatively primitive technology may have also played a crucial role in their extinction. While impressive that they showed some capability for tool use, their tools were basic compared to those of other hominins. Essentially, this limited technological development could have put them at a disadvantage in terms of hunting, gathering, and processing food, as well as in defending themselves against predators or other hominins. In a world where technological advancement is increasingly important for survival, Homo naledi's reliance on simpler tools might have hindered their ability to adapt to new challenges. This could have contributed to their eventual decline, especially as other hominids began to dominate the landscape. Another theory is that Homo naledi may have also suffered from isolation and a small population size. If their population was relatively small and confined to specific regions, they would have been more vulnerable to environmental changes, disease, and competition. Not to mention, small populations are also more susceptible to inbreeding and genetic drift. This can lead to a loss of genetic diversity and make it harder for a species to adapt to changing conditions. And to make matters worse, if Homo naledi occupied a niche that was gradually disappearing due to climate change or competition, their isolation could have prevented them from finding new habitats or resources, thereby accelerating their decline. 
Another factor that might have contributed to Homo naledi's extinction is the apparent lack of evidence for cultural complexity compared to other hominins. While the potential deliberate disposal of their dead suggests some level of social behavior, there is no strong evidence of more advanced cultural practices, such as symbolic art, complex toolmaking, or organized social structures, which are seen in other hominins like Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. It might not look like it, but cultural complexity can be a key factor in a species' ability to survive and adapt to changing environments. Without it, Homo naledi may have struggled to compete with other hominins that were developing these capabilities. Ultimately, the exact cause of Homo naledi's extinction remains unknown. It was likely a combination of factors, including environmental changes, competition with other hominins, limited technology, and possibly even diseases that led to their decline. After all, some individuals were found with bony lesions, suggestive of a benign tumor, and others had dental defects. There is also the case that the minimum winter temperatures in the area average about 3 degrees or 37 degrees Fahrenheit and can drop below freezing. As such, staying warm for an infant of the small-bodied Homo naledi would have been difficult. This would have been a problem, as the winters likely increased their susceptibility to respiratory diseases. Essentially, they might have had a flu season much like modern South Africa today. So much is up for debate. What is clear, however, is that by the time modern humans began spreading across Africa, Homo naledi had already vanished. All that was left were their fossilized remains. The discovery of Homo naledi, although recent, has profoundly impacted our understanding of human evolution. So far, it has revealed that the journey of our species was far more complex and varied than previously thought. From their brain size to their way of life, their story is a reminder of the diverse paths taken by different hominin species, many of which ultimately ended in extinction. And while we Homo sapiens are the last surviving members of a once rich and varied lineage, we must look to the past to understand our history as we battle conditions that just might put us on the path of our ancient ancestors and cousins. But what do you think? Was Homo naledi capable of burials? Were they smarter than we give them credit for? And most importantly, how do you think they got into the cave? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. If you're curious about the famous Australopithecus and their role in our evolutionary story, click on this video right here. Or, if you want to dive into this incredible tale of how humanity nearly vanished, check out this video over here. While you're at it, why not hit the like and subscribe buttons to learn all about the wonders of prehistoric times. Until next time, bye.